All right. Hello, everyone who's just joined us. We're going to just give some other folks another minute or two just to hop on into Zoom. Hi, Julia. <laughs> I see you. Okay. All right. Well, I guess we will get started. So hello, everyone. My name is Gianna. I'm one of the reference librarians here at the Chelmsford Public Library. Um, tonight, we are joined by Jane O'Neill for our program on Art on Thursdays presents Heavy Lies the Crown, the brief and brilliant career of Basquiat. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Jane, Jane O'Neill is the founder of Culturally Curious, an arts education consulting firm specializing in art appreciation programs. She curates and delivers programs throughout New England and beyond. O'Neill holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in um, education from Harvard University. Born and raised in New Hampshire, she has worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as the executive director, and the Currier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. Jane has also taught at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at Southern New Hampshire University. And for more information, please visit IamCulturallyCurious.com, and I'll be sure to add that link in the chat so that um, we'll be able to send that out to everyone at a later time. So without further ado, let me hand it over to Jane. Thanks so much, Gianna, and thank you everybody for tuning in tonight to learn a little bit more about Basquiat. I promise you, you are going to come away from this program with a newfound love and respect for the work of this often misunderstood artist. Before we get started, I just want to acknowledge the help that I've had from a fellow scholar named Lisa Clark in putting this particular program together. She did a lot of her original research on this, so I thank her for that. We will be getting back to this image on the screen in just a moment, but I wanted to just give you um, sort of a brief thumbnail sketch in terms terms of who Basquiat was, what we're getting into tonight. Now, just to get you situated on the timeline here, Basquiat was born in 1960. He died in 1988. So he had a very short career. It was, I mean, for all intents and purposes, less than a decade, but he was more prolific than Vincent van Gogh. And his paintings, you will see, are layered and they're dense with meaning and references and symbols. He was an exceptional figure in the art world, not just for this very exuberant work, that we're going to see, but also for the fact that he was a young Black man working in a lily white uh, elitist arena, really. Now, he, what we'll see is that he painted pictures that reflect the Black experience. Um, and that was really highly unusual for the art world at that time. We're going to be unpacking as much of this as possible over the course of the next hour. As always, if you have questions along the way, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll circle back to them at the end. I thought I would get started with a spoiler, <laughs> the big spoiler. And that is Basquiat is a big deal in on the art market these days. In 2017, this untitled work from 1982 sold for more than $110 million. And at the time that was the highest price ever paid for a work of art by an American artist. So I want you to sit with this work for just a couple of extra seconds, really. Um, consider what you might like about it. Consider what you dislike about it. What do you find challenging or perplexing when you look at this work of art? We'll be getting back to this painting a little bit later too, but I think it's, it's sort of good to kind of check in with your initial impressions of Basquiat's paintings. All right, now let me give you the lay of the land and how we're going to spend this next hour together. We're going to start off with, a, with an introduction to the artist, Jean-Michel Basquiat. We'll turn our attention to the early years of his career when he was working as a street artist. And so we'll look at some of the personal symbols that he developed uh, during that period of, of art making. Then we're gonna turn our attention to his interest in music and how, um, hip hop sampling might have influenced his approach to art making. And then 
Basquiat was somebody who was sort of surrounded by all of these really sort of famous and influential people in the 1980s. So we'll look at how he becomes a celebrity, how he hangs out with celebrities and some of the collaborations that went along with that. And then we'll um, touch on the fact that he is uh, or was a black man working in uh, the very white art world and, and how his Blackness played a role in terms of um, the work that he produced and how he was understood by the media. And then finally, we'll wrap up with his death and legacy. Uh, this work here didn't really fit into any other section of the program, but it's just too charming to leave out. We're looking at, you know, the king of the dinosaurs, the T-Rex here. This is called Pez Dis Dispenser from 1984. Um, all right, let's get started with an introduction to Jean-Michel Basquiat and here are two adorable pictures of him as a little boy. Like I said, he was born in 1960 in Park Slope, Brooklyn, and he was born into a solidly middle-class family. He was a precocious child and he learned to read and write by the time he was four years old. As somebody with a four-year-old child, I can tell you this is nothing short of remarkable. <laughs> Here are two pictures of Basquiat as, as a young man, um, on the left with his father, on the right with his mother. Now his father was born in Haiti his mother was born in America to Puerto Rican parents. So by the age of 11, Jean-Michel Basquiat could, uh, was fluent in, in three different languages, English, French, and Spanish. And he had these sort of um, important influential relationships with his parents. His, his father recognized that his, his son was a talented and, and precocious young man. Uh, he recounted a story about how at the age of six, Jean-Michel said, Papa, do you know about energy? There's energy all around us. When I move my hand, I create energy. There's energy everywhere, Papa. And his mother played a special role in her son's arts education. She brought him to all all of the major museums in Manhattan and in the boroughs, including the Met and BoMA and the Guggenheim and the Brooklyn Museum. As you see here, he got a junior membership, which I'm sure his mom helped to facilitate. Now, she was really interested in fashion and fashion design. So the two of them would visit these museums and then go home and make sketches together based on what they saw. So, um, so it was a, a really sort of important formative relationship and ex formative experience in the arts. Another really significant thing happened to Jean-Michel Basquiat as a young man. And that was at the age of seven, he was playing basketball in the streets and he was hit by a car. And there was a very long recovery involved with, um, with that particular incident. He was in the hospital for nearly a month and his mother brought him a copy of Grey's Anatomy to basically review while you're sitting there uh, bored to tears in a hospital room. And he just internalized everything from this text. And what we'll see is that throughout his career, he seems to be referencing um, not just anatomy, but but the very text Grey's Anatomy. He even does a whole anatomy series. We can see just one image from that series over here. And it looks like a direct reference to the cover that we see over on the left. So, um, so this notion of the human body, bones, skulls, sinew, it all comes into play when we're thinking about Basquiat. And he references this car accident quite a bit as well. This is um, a painting that he created early in his career. This is from 1981. We can see um, references to moving vehicles. In this case, the car sort of looks like an ambulance, but we also have two planes here. And we see the letter A repeated again and again. Basquiat sort of had a thing for the letter A, but in this case, it sort of reminds us of the whale of an ambulance. In addition to that, we have a cannon with cannonballs and a hammer with nails over here. And both of these things sort of explode or have this kind of visceral um, sound and, and vibration with, um, when, when you strike a hammer. And both of these things were probably included in, in this particular painting as references to that experience of being struck by a car. Now, if we go back to, um, to Jean-Michel Basquiat, yeah, and this timeline of his, he's, he's now a teenager and um, his teen years were really marked by turmoil. His mother had been struggling with mental illness throughout her life and was um, sort of in and out of institutions to deal with that. His father was occasionally violent and Basquiat began to run away from home. Uh, after a week or so, his father would 
usually find him somewhere around Washington Square Park and then bring him home. But by the age of 17, Basquiat was um, ready to leave for good. And he moved out of his parents' home in Brooklyn, managed to survive by just crashing with friends and occasionally living on the streets. Now, this doesn't sound like it, but at the same time, he was incredibly ambitious and he believed from a very young age, really, that he was destined to poor success. Now, a friend who knew him early on uh, wrote, he could walk into a thrift store with five bucks and come out looking like a king. In fact, he basically behaved like a king who had accidentally switched lives with an identical popper. So it's interesting to think about that kind of uh, way of presenting yourself to the world. Now, I mentioned before that Basquiat sort of gets his, um, gets his start in the art world as a street artist or as a graffiti artist. We can see here from the photos of him with um, with the spray paint can that he's essentially using the side of buildings as his canvas early on. And what we'll find, because we've got a whole other section on this, is that he's very good at marketing himself. He, we're going to see that how he brands his works and how he tags strategic locations in order to get noticed. More on that in just a moment. But when it comes to Basquiat and as a painter with a, with a paintbrush, um, he was poor in those early years. And so he oftentimes did not have a canvas. So we can see that he might paint on any available surface, whether it's a refrigerator door, or in this case, a TV set. Uh, he had a real thing for TVs, and he kind of always had a TV on, blaring the news. And as he was working, as he was painting, he might have 10 different books open on the floor that he's kind of looking at and internalizing and referencing. And then he might even be playing the radio as well, too. Um, so it's sort of like the uh, 1980s equivalent of all of us having, you know, 50 tabs open on our web browser on a given day. But when it comes to Basquiat, he was really um, infusing all of these different sources into his work. So what we'll find as we go along is that it's almost like a test. Do you get the references? Have you looked hard enough to find them? Now, in order to make ends meet in those very early days, as he's uh, just sort of struggling to live, he was painting postcards, he would paint t-shirts and sweatshirts like the ones that you see here. These are sort of um, uh, examples of his work that were left behind at a girlfriend's house. But occasionally he would even go into his girlfriend's closets and like paint their clothes. I don't think that was always a totally welcome surprise. But as we just round out this quick introduction to the artist, we've got some great photos of him here. Um, big picture, Jean-Michel Basquiat broke into the whitewashed world of fine art with absolutely no formal training as an artist. He went from being homeless to becoming a millionaire at the age of 21. The same year he sold his first painting for $200,000, he began selling paintings for $20,000. And he couldn't keep up with the demand. On the far right over here, we see him painting in an $800 Armani suit. Remember, this is the era of like the yuppie too. But the whole point of doing this was to ruin the suit every time. <laughs> now, he intuitively understood that his art was more than just his paintings. It was sort of about the way he lived, the way he presented himself. So he took on this idea of art as, um, or I should say life as really an art project. And um, and despite his, his very premature death, he's still regarded as a genius, as a barrier breaker, and as this kind of art fully disheveled style icon. Look at how like he's always got like one lapel sort of flipped up like this. Uh, people are still very much fascinated by him today. And, and I think you'll agree too that there's a lot about what he was doing that still feels revolutionary. All right, so let's turn our attention to street art and personal symbols. This is where Jean-Michel Basquiat's ideas really sort of begin to take root. Okay. So in the late 1970s, Basquiat was sent to a special school for gifted and talented students called City as a School. This was a school for 
kids that weren't necessarily doing well in a traditional classroom setting, but were really bright. And it was based on this idea of learning by doing. While there, he meets a young man named Al Diaz, and they become artistic collaborators. They adopt this pseudonym called SAMO. Here's SAMO over here, S-A-M-O, oftentimes with the little copyright symbol here. SAMO stands for same old shit. <laughs> and so SAMO became their graffiti signature. And, um, and sometimes when we think of graffiti, we think of, um, of purely visu visual. Sometimes we think of it as text-based. For, um, for Diaz and for Basquiat as SAMO, it's essentially all text-based graffiti. And uh, as, as by the time they're collaborating, their tags are start showing up all over lower Manhattan. So here are a couple of examples of their graffiti work. We have SAMO copyright symbol as a conglomerate of dormant genius. SAMO for the so-called avant-garde. And then I especially love this one. SAMO as an end to the nine to five, went to college, not tonight, honey blue. SAMO for you. So a lot of this stuff is sort of cryptic, it's enigmatic, but it seems to be a little provocative. Sometimes it points fingers directly at people in power. Al Diaz described what they were doing as sort of being in the same vein as like ancient Roman graffiti. It's a way of making statements about the community. And they would oftentimes put this graffiti in places where um, people of the art world would notice them. Um, and this is how uh, young Basquiat really gets recognized. We've got another example of his tags over here. Which of the following is omnipresent? Lee Harvey Oswald, Coca-Cola logo, logo, General, Melonry, or Samo. Um, so he, uh, his identity is revealed uh, by way of the Village Voice, the, the um, popular magazine. And that was uh, as, as early as 1978, but that's what served as his springboard really. And so from that point forward, he sort of retires himself as, as a graffiti artist and he starts to try and uh, break into the world of fine art. So let's sort of see a transitional piece here that, that uh, we can see the ideas of the graffiti art sort of being placed on, uh, on the page here. And so with this work, which is collage, of course, we see a couple of different types of paper that are taped together. We see some kind of expressionist marker work over here, but it's it's pretty much a text-based work with all caps letters, similar to his Samo uh, street art. And the text here reads, death is Rolades, fast relief, Popeye died of syphilis, eating cheeseburgers on, on color TV in front of his mother. It's like a love-hate relationship with Walt Disney. And then it goes on essentially to repeat that. Now, um, it's hard to know exactly what he's going for in something like this. Is this supposed to be commentary? Is this supposed to be some kind of poetry? Is it a combination of the two things? It's hard to say. But what we do know is that Basquiat essentially had the soul of a poet. Here he is hanging around with William Burroughs at Allen Ginsberg house. He had this interest in language and text and symbol and how this all kind of fused together um, in the art world. Uh, right alongside this, on, on the right, we have an image of his good friend and fellow artist, Keith Haring, standing in front of one of his uh, recognizable murals here with his familiar dancing figures. So both Haring and Basquiat sort of understood this great power of words and symbols coming together. Let's look at how how that street art background, this focus on text, influences works on canvas now. So this is a 1982 painting. It's still pretty early for him. Um, notice the way uh, he's essentially created the frame here. This is a, a pretty uh, sort of low budget way to, to create um, a, a stretched canvas. This is somebody who is kind of desperately trying to make something, something. What we'll find is that he almost had a compulsion to produce art. And like I said, he would essentially paint on anything. So this is a work called Multi Flavors. And we see in this painting, a real emphasis on text. And as our eyes move around, we can see words like chicken and pork and wings. And, and so we, we get the idea that this is sort of like a sign. Um, it's all caps lettering, sort of like his street art, but it's not something that's 
really fully coherent here. It's rather like loose associations. And Basquiat once said, there are about 30 words around you at all times. And he said, for example, like thread or exit. And I'm sure if you're really conscious about it tomorrow and you're, and you're thinking about what are those words, you might hear your 30 words around you all the time too. <coughs> So this is just a good reminder that this is somebody who's sort of like inhaling and internalizing all of the sources um, in his life to then produce on the page. So we have the, the text as, as image here and Basquiat does something throughout his career that I just find so fascinating. He um, intuitively seems to understand that if you cross out text or obscure text, that it becomes much more fascinating to an audience. We're much more determined to figure out what was there and then obscured. And so we'll see crossed out text or obscured text uh, in a lot of his works. We also see um, some symbols here. We see the, the familiar crown, which we'll talk about in just a moment. <clears throat> as well as some circles that have sort of been scratched out over here on the right. So let's turn our attention to that crown. This is his most recognized symbol. When Basquiat abandoned graffiti art or street art to focus on painting, he retired the same O tag and he changes his logo or tag name to this crown. And it, effect it effectively functions as his signature. Now, I just think it's such a brilliant choice on his part because the crown is this universal symbol. It's easy to understand whether you're a child or an adult, rich or poor, naive or sophisticated. We all have these very strong associations with what it means to have a crown, um, to, to don a crown for a day or for a lifetime. It has mass appeal too. Who among us doesn't want to wear a crown? That's why I bring my kids to Burger King so that they can put on the little crown just for the meal. Um, and Basquiat sort of understood that people love these crowns and that having a crown would help to sort of raise his stature. Before he begins to do that, really, he, he paints this crown uh, in association with people that, that he idolized, um, whether they were sports players or, um, or musicians. And then ultimately, he, he gets coronated too, as we'll see. So here he is with another early work. This one's called Minor Success from 1982. And we can see um, that there are a couple of, of really familiar elements here. Uh, first of all, he's painting on something that is not a canvas. This looks like a, a cabinet door here that still has its hinges on it. On the top panel, we have a, a familiar yellow crown. In the center, we have um, a, a essentially an obscured face here. Maybe this is a self-portrait of the artist. It's accompanied by uh, the letter A nine times. And then at the bottom, a uh, simple automobile with more letter A's. So it's as though we sort of have his life story kind of playing out here between the car accident and the coronation. Okay, so we, we see that he loves this letter A, he loves this crown. Um, and so in some cases, a, a painting might just be somebody's name. In this case, Aaron is a reference to Hank Aaron. Um, and of course, every time he uses this copyright symbol, it's it's to be playful. It's to kind of poke at, at um, how ludicrous it would be to copyright graffiti, or in this case, to copyright a work of fine art. But he's giving Hank Aaron a crown here. He's also painted this helmet, again, with the name Aaron, again, with a crown, and put it on his own head. Now, just to pause here for a moment and, and think about how revolutionary this is for the time. It's the early 1980s, and there's really nothing in our visual culture up until uh, at this point in our history where we see um, Black figures, significant figures in music, in, in sports, what have you, being uh, treated, given this royal treatment, so to speak. We're uh, more accustomed to it now because of works by artists like Kehinde Wiley, who famously painted Barack Obama's portrait, and other images where he is essentially con uh, inserting contemporary Black men into traditional modes of expression um, that would convey royalty and status. But prior to that, I mean, there simply weren't artists who were elevating Black figures in, in this way until Basquiat comes along. So he was doing something important and really different at the time. Now, let's 
shift gears for a moment. We're going to turn our attention to Basquiat as a musician and, um, and think about how he might have, have um, used this idea of sampling in his works. So here we have two images of Basquiat playing, um, pl playing music, making music here. Here he is with his band. I believe he's playing the clarinet here. Um, the band was like a noise rock band. And what that really means is that all of these musicians here had no experience whatsoever playing these instruments. So they were really just improvising. They were making sound. I'm sure it was quite a racket. <laughs> but believe it or not, they got gigs. They actually um, performed at a, a lot of noteworthy clubs. The name of the band as given to them by Basquiat was Grey, which is, of course, a reference to Grey's Anatomy. Incidentally, one of the clubs that they played at was called A. It was located on Broom Street in Manhattan. So, um, so a, a lot of things sort of uh, circling back again and again in the ether. So uh, let's turn our attention now here to a couple of, of paintings that he created that are uh, references to music. We have an image over here from 1986 called saxophone. Oftentimes he would purposely misspell uh, words in, in his paintings. And then over here we have the trumpet, which we started with tonight. This is from 1984. Now in saxophone, we see a couple of black bodies, just about pieces of black bodies. Uh, here's our saxophone right here. And we see a lot of text that doesn't necessarily seem to make sense when it's uh, combined together. We do see things that that seem to allude to music, but we see a lot of other texts that, that, um, that seems to have references to things outside of the saxophone. Now over here with trumpet, we see a sort of a more straightforward uh, presentation of a musician and his instrument. In this case, the text seems to be um, sort of spelling out for us the sound that is emanating from this, this particular instrument. So we get something that sort of looks like DDD. D, D. Um, and it's also obscured. We don't know exactly what, what sound is coming from, from this instrument. It could be a D, it could be an H, who knows. Um, but we get a sense that, that there's, there's music being played here. Now notice too with trumpet that he has painted the face of this figure as, as black. And he's also painted the crown as black. And I think in this case, that has some significance because he's really tying Sort of the racial identity to the coronation in this in, in this particular work and when you do that too i mean a, a crown can sometimes mean not royalty but but a way to um to to highlight and pay homage to to somebody's intellect. So I think by, by using the same color in, in trumpet, he's, he's really drawing that particular association there. Here is yet another work about um, Basquiat and his interest in music. This one's called Horn Players from 1983. And we see um, the celebration of musicians that he really liked. We have Charlie Parker and um, Dizzy Gillespie. So we see the, the term uh, ornithology over here that's, of course, uh, reference to Charlie Parker's legendary jazz standard from 1946. So um, with this work, we see this, uh, this celebration of the improvisational style of jazz. And we sort of get a sense that that's mirrored in Basquiat's own creation of this particular work, that he is being improvis improvisational as he's creating it. So once again, we see words that are obscured, painted out, crossed out. Um, there's this kind of playfulness and, and kind of a magic that all comes together as he's doing this. And that's probably why he repeats the term alchemy again and again and again, this idea that, um, that something sort of magical happens when you allow this kind of freedom of expression. There's a transformation in this creative process. So one other element that I want to draw your attention to with this particular work is the fact that it's cut into, well, not cut, but divided into these three panels here. I think that that is probably a reference to um, historical mm -hmm. paintings that are divided into multiple panels. These are typically called altarpieces or triptychs, uh, a, a reference to a three panel painting. And historically, these have always been paintings of saints and the divine, you know, going back hundreds and hundreds of years. So to adopt this format in a portrayal of, of people he um, 
idolized is a way to elevate their status in a different way. Rather than giving them a crown, he's essentially making them holy figures to him. Now, continuing on with Basquiat and his interest in music and the way he sort of um, experimented in music in similar ways, he, he oftentimes DJed at really notable clubs in lower Manhattan. And apparently he was quite the dancer too. One of his friends said he looked like a Bowery bum and a fashion model all at the same time. He had like a, his own style of dancing all into himself. He also even dabbled in music, in producing music. And so this is the, um, the album cover of a song that he produced called Beat Bop. It's a 10 minute hip hop track. And apparently if you collect these sort of things, it's like the holy grail of hip hop uh, tracks because only 500 copies were produced. And so with this image, we can see once again, a lot of familiar elements here. First, we see the title of the song, Beat Bop. It's been crossed out. We see the familiar crown here. We see bones, references to, to Grey's Anatomy. We see bangs, um, this, ex this um, uh, expression of something hitting something, which could be a, a reference to that car accident. And every time I look at this work, uh, I don't know, there's something going on here underneath that crown that sort of looks like a skull to me. And those skulls uh, tend to pop up a lot in Basquiat's paintings. But now we're going to sort of turn our attention to see how Basquiat as an artist sampled other artists and integrates um, you know, little elements of style from other famous artists. So let's start off with a really well-known artist. This is um, a, sort of a reference, obviously, to Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa. In this case, this is Basquiat's Boone from 1983. And Mary Boone was his art dealer at the time. So this is a nice way to kind of reference um, this, this woman who's working in the arts, sort of modify a Mona Lisa and add the name down below. And of course, by doing this, he's referencing another great graffiti artist or work of graffiti art, really. And that is Marcel Duchamp's uh, uh, send up of the Mona Lisa from the early 20th century, where he adds this, this text at the bottom, which if you pronounce these letters with a French accent, it basically says something naughty about, about the Mona Lisa, who he's given a, a mustache and a goatee here. So Basquiat's doing something similar by, by inserting the name Boone here as well. But he's also thinking about Leonardo da Vinci. And one of the one of the arguments around this is the way he has written uh, this this letter B, because you can see that he's actually laid down the letter L first and then laid the B over it. So some art historians think that he's actually sort of tying his own um, name here to that of Leonardo. So we've got our Leonardo and our Basquiat. Um, getting us started here with sampling, but he was really familiar with Leonardo da Vinci, familiar, uh, I think, especially with his notebooks, his diagrams, um, his sketches. So here is um, one of Leonardo da Vinci's famous uh, sketches of an aerial screw. And you sort of uh, see with the Basquiat work over here on the right, the same sense of, um, of drawing, of something technical, of creating a diagram, uh, it often surfaces in, in many of his work. He was also really interested, and I think profoundly influenced by expressionist painters of the mid 20th century. So here on the left is a painting by Willem de Kooning. This is called Woman One from 1952. And we can see these kind of wild brushstrokes, wild gestural brushstrokes here, um, even though the painting is still kind of loosely based on the figure, you can see something very similar happening with the Basquiat work over here on the right. There's this looseness, this freedom with the way the paint is being applied to canvas, but we also have something that references the world around us, something that we can still make sense out of. I, I love this comparison here because there's these kind of fleshy tones in both of these works. Another influential artist or an artist that Basquiat might have sampled a little bit was the artist Cy Twombly, who was famous for creating these works that looked like scribbled text. And of course, Basquiat would have been interested in any A word, as we see over here on the left. On the right, we have a great comparison because this is 
an almost entirely text-based work created by Basquiat, also in reference to the jazz musician Charlie Parker. Um, it almost functions like a tombstone because it references where he died and, and the date that that happened. Um, so so you, you get the sense that he's really familiar with what artists, especially a generation or two um, before him, were doing. One last artist I wanted to reference is Robert Rauschenberg. And this is over here on the right, a detail of the painting on the left. Um, standing a little bit further away from it, it looks a little wild. It looks very expressionist. As you sort of get in closer, you can see that there are layers and layers of collage in here. There's like um, meaning that's sort of buried in the painting that you really have to kind of search to find. And I think we've already established that that Basquiat had these layers, not just in his mind and in his life, but he, he buried them in his paintings as well. Many of his paintings are works that he painted over and he leaves like these little opportunities to kind of see through places into those earlier works. So they, they are rich and deep like this. He also uses collage in his paintings as well. This is a nine foot tall painting called Glenn from 1984. And you can see that it's like layer, well, the painting itself is on top of pages and pages of these notebook drawings that, um, that come from Basquiat. Now there's a few things happening just with this giant head in this painting that I think are noteworthy too. We can see um, sort of a reference to African art influences with um, with the with the way that the the the, um, the the face has been reduced down to these kind of uh, simple almond shaped eyes here in particular, we can also see other things that look like references to the world around us. Notice how this top row of teeth kind of looks like a checkerboard. It reminds me almost of um, like that checkerboard line of, uh, of decoration that you would see on the side of a yellow cab in the 1980s. Up top um, where his brain is, we see what almost looks like a keyboard with uh, what could be almost like uh, uh, signifiers of sound coming out of the top of his head. It could be hairs coming out of the top of his head, but they sort of match um, what looks like sound coming out of this figure's mouth as well. Let's talk about those lines for a second. There is so much sort of, I, I would interpret this as almost nervous energy. One art historian called Basquiat's lines, shivers like someone naked in a, in a snowstorm. There is so much vitality and exuberance in those lines. So we're going to wrap up this uh, section on music and sampling uh, by looking at three examples of Basquiat's skulls. That's probably what he's best known for. And I think when you look at these works here, you kind of see all those other influences coming together, this expressionist brushwork in the background. Um, you can see, you know, perhaps these references to scars and, and his experience with uh, 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 being in the hospital and internalizing Grey's Anatomy uh, on some of the faces of these figures, along with that, you know, all of this exuberant line as, uh, as well. Now, when we think about skulls in general, this is another kind of form of sampling too, because skulls have been a, a subject and an interest for artists for centuries. This is a Baroque era skull over here on the left. And then we get all the way up into the 1970s and artists like Andy Warhol are, are still using the skull as a subject because it's still so ripe with all of these references. So why wouldn't Basquiat adopt that as his own? Now, Andy Warhol is a great segue to this next section that we're going to be considering uh, Basquiat as a celebrity and his celebrity friends and collaborations. Now he was in the right place at the right time and he met all the right people. This is him with Fab Five Freddy, the hip hop and street artist pioneer. Here he is with Keith Haring, who I've already sort of referenced earlier, a fellow artist that uh, he had a very close relationship with. And he was collaborating with all of these artists along the way, this is a collaboration between Basquiat and Keith Haring. Uh, once again, Keith Haring created these uh, very easy to recognize dancing figures here. And just by knowing that Basquiat's um, uh, lines are so agile 
agitated, you can really get a, a sense easily in terms of the elements of this picture that he contributed to. And he no doubt contributed to the text here, which doesn't necessarily make sense to us. I also, uh, he no doubt added the, the crown over here. And I have no doubt that he filled in this figure to be a black figure here. So when we think about his collaborations here, you can almost imagine it as this visual conversation between him and his friend. What I wouldn't give to own one of these collaborations. Now, when it comes to owning Basquiat's work, I mentioned um, the very first year he sold a painting. Um, that's That was the year that, that rocketed him to success. And the first time he ever sold a painting, it was to Debbie Harry. Here he is with Debbie Harry of Blondie. Uh, they appeared together in a movie called New York Beat. It was loosely inspired by Basquiat's life as a street artist. When the movie finished uh, uh, filming, the, the crew actually pooled their money and went and bought Basquiat paints and canvases and brushes. And one of the first works that he produced on canvas, uh, this work over here called Cadillac Moon, was the painting that Debbie Harry purchased for $200. A lot of familiar elements here with the A's and the cars. Notice that he's crossed out Samo with the copyright symbol and added his name, Jean-Michel Jean Basquiat here. He actually went on to appear in one of um, Debbie Harry's videos uh, for a song called Rapture, which is considered to be the first rap song to ever chart number one in the United States. He's only on there for a couple of seconds. And then he, um, he goes on to date none other than Madonna. She was on the cusp of making it big. Um, she was in the process of recording her first album, and he is really already a very well-known entity in the art market. Now, she talked about how, um, or she has talked about how prolific he was, how she'd wake up in the middle of the night and he's just uh, working, 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 always creating. And she said he was deeply talented. She really loved him, but she also said what got in the way of their relationship was the fact that he was using heroin. Um, so even early on in the early 1980s, heroin was a part of his life. Now, interestingly, when they broke up, Basquiat asked Madonna to give back every painting he had ever given to her. And then he painted over them in black. What a way to break up with someone. Then he would create something new out of those paintings. Here's a fairly recent photo of Madonna in an art museum standing in front of one of those paintings that she had to give back to Basquiat. Notice that he has crossed out her name and then he added Venus, which was the nickname of the next girl he started dating. So uh, he, apparently he wasn't a good breaker upper. <laughs> but without a doubt, out of all of these celebrity friendships, the most important one was with Andy Warhol. And they had a, an absolutely adorable, neat, cute moment. So um, Basquiat is the struggling young artist. He sees Andy Warhol um, dining outside with a friend one day. And remember Basquiat was making some money selling painted postcards. And he goes up to Andy Warhol and sells him this very postcard on the screen, screen here that says, stupid games, bad ideas. <laughs> and it was only a couple of years later after Basquiat is already getting sort of noticed and getting a little famous that Andy Warhol becomes interested in him of course because there's some fame involved so the two are sort of set up to have a lunch together a working lunch together and at the end uh Andy Warhol took a Polaroid picture of the two of them together and gave it to Basquiat Basquiat ran back to his studio and produced this work in response to that Polaroid picture and then had it immediately sent to Andy Warhol all the way across town. Um, it got there within two hours of the end of their lunch. Um, Andy Warhol said it probably took an hour of time just in traffic alone to get to us. So, uh, I mean, Basquiat really churned this right out. The paint was still wet, but it was the beginning of a beautiful artistic relationship. Uh, uh, Warhol here returns the favor and does a, a screen print a portrait of Basquiat, which has sold for $34 million. He also gave Basquiat a great place to work too. So um, Warhol owned a, a space on Great Jones Street, and in 1983, Basquiat moved into that space and essentially worked there right up until his death. Um, here are the two artists together, and it looks like Warhol might even be wearing a, a jacket here that was 
painted on by Basquiat. Incidentally, if you wanted to rent the same studio space, it's only $60,000 a month now to be at, the, at that same location. Now, the two artists started collaborating um, just uh, the following year, 1984, and their mutual friend, Keith Haring, said the collaborations were seemingly effortless. It was a physical conversation happening in paint instead of words. Basquiat and Warhol had a, had a, a really close friendship. And as they started painting together, uh, Warhol was making his familiar marks. He was making things like corporate logos. Uh, we can see him painting the Ford logo here, the GE logo. And then he would sort of laugh because Basquiat would come in and, and essentially graffiti over all of these corporate logos. And Warhol would kind of laugh about it and say, he just keeps painting me out again and again. So they, they had several exhibitions together. This was one of the first ones. I love this serious curator pose that they both adopted over here on the right. Um, but most of these paintings involved the GE logo. This was 1984, so it's uh, in the middle of an energy crisis and we see Basquiat seemingly responding to that by inserting images of like trucks and skulls into into these works and that's a good reminder to us that you know even six-year-old Basquiat was talking to his father about energy and how energy is all around us here now not all of their collaborations were well received this is a uh, promotional material for their 1985 collaboration with these images that will sort of like go down in history because the show was panned and the New York Times actually referred to Basquiat as being Warhol's mascot. And man, he did not like that, understandably. So he took this criticism really hard and he began to sort of distance himself from Andy Warhol after that. Um, he'd been using uh, heroin sort of all along and then he leaned into using heroin after this, this uh, essentially his split with, with Warhol. Even Warhol wrote in his diary at the end of 1985, Jean-Michel hasn't called me in a month, so I guess it really is over. Now, by all accounts, Andy Warhol was like a father to Jean-Michel, and, um, and he was one of the few people in his life who could help him rein in his heroin use. So when, uh, when a fracture appeared in that relationship, it spelled out pretty bad things for, for Basquiat. One last note related to Warhol. Now we know Warhol loved a good logo and, and I think he was probably helpful um, even before the two artists met in helping to shape Basquiat's approach to creating a logo for himself. Now we know the crown becomes his logo, but in earlier iterations, uh, he would paint it differently sort of every time. Sometimes it would have five points or four points. And we know he settles ultimately on the three point crown, which is like simple, it's iconic, it functions really well. It also sort of has a W in it. And so some art historians think that that was kind of his nod to Andy Warhol there. All right, so in our last few moments here, we're going to touch on Basquiat and his identity as a Black artist. Now, he was the first to say, I'm not a Black artist, I am an artist, but his identity as a Black man was kind of um, it, uh, inseparable from his identity in the art world because the art world was so very lily white and you know, to this day, largely is too. Um, we have Warhol back here, we have Keith Haring back here, and we have Basquiat who doesn't look uh, entirely comfortable in this particular image. So um, throughout his career, Basquiat would create images that seem to reference the Black experience. Um, I remember doing a little bit of research on this work called The World Crown from 1981, and art historians have, have sort of documented at length um, Basquiat's interest in, in Muhammad Ali and where Muhammad Ali had been fighting in months and years leading up to the production of this work in particular. And then at the end of this long essay that I was reading, they sort of acknowledge, well, this might not be about Muhammad Ali at all. This might be about Basquiat himself. So what are we looking at here? This is an image of two, of two boxers. One of them is a white boxer. One of them is a black boxer. They both have these sort of silver crowns. The longer you look, the 
more you realize that both of these boxers are just grimacing. There's nothing beautiful about their faces here, but we also see that this black boxer who um, sort of seems anchored to the edge of the image here, he is, um, he, he's sort of like desperately trying to land this punch over here. And so work like this could very well be emblematic. It could be a stand-in for the struggles that uh, a Black man in, in a white-dominated society or in a white-dominated field might actually feel. Now, Basquiat ran into a lot of problems uh, being a Black man in a white-dominated field. He was, you know, he's, he's, selling paintings for for tens of thousands of dollars but he would leave a gallery opening and he wouldn't be able to hail a cab he would get held up at airports all the time because nobody expected a rich person to look like him to be so young and to be black and to have dreadlocks so all of these things were um were things that he was wrestling with and and of course they would emerge in his artwork from time to time. Um, in the work over here on the left, we see uh, direct references to the history of slavery in the United States. Uh, between the words Africa and Mississippi and slave ship, we've got these uh, black skull-like faces over here, direct references to violence as well. On the right, we have a work that's called Light Blue Murders from 1983. And, um, and what we see here are two black men who are in service of sort of a, an invisible but assumed sort of white upper class here. They're doing the heavy lifting, literally, and they're kind of grunting about it here. Um, down below is some text that comes from Basquiat's Samo days, which talks about the livery line and, um, and being crushed, their feet being crushed, uh, essentially. And we see these big sort of flat feet on, on, on the bodies of the movers here. And so he has this understanding of of this power dynamic that, that exists in, in the United States. And of course, it, that's translated visually into so many of his works. Now, one of his most impactful and most enduring works, I think, is uh, called The Death of Michael Stewart. This was painted in 1983. And this was in response to an event that happened in his lifetime. A young graffiti artist named Michael Stewart was caught by the police uh, tagging in a subway station. The police uh, beat him, they strangled him, and he ultimately died from his injuries. The white police officers were charged with criminally negligent homicide, uh, but were found not guilty by an all white jury. So in this work, we can see a direct reference to the death of Michael Stewart, but he is represented without any specific details because of course Basquiat could look at an incident like that and think that could very well be me or essentially any other young street artist. The, the, the cops are represented as, as being particularly brutal and, and sort of demonic here. And then at the top of, of the image in Spanish, we have the, the word defacement. And so of course, Basquiat is asking us to consider, um, was, was this death uh, uh, like a, a, a just result of defacing something? Or really what has been defaced here, but um, not the subway system, but the justice system and the defacement of, of this young life, really. Uh, he created a number of works that were about, uh, well, I, I guess before I move on from that, I should say, you know, this is such an enduring work too, because of course, we're still having these conversations as a, as a country, because incidents like this continue to happen. So you can imagine if you, um, you're teaching art history and, and, you know, George Floyd is killed. I mean, wouldn't you want to turn your attention to something like this as an opportunity to, um, to talk about how um, these seem to be recurring events in the United States. Now, Basquiat returns to the subject of, of the police uh, a number of times during his career. This is called Irony of a Negro Policeman from 1981. Sometimes when he really wants to get his point across, he doesn't take great efforts to cross out words or letters. So we he's very clear in his text here, ir Irony of a Negro Policeman, along with the word pawn here, and this kind of grotesque presentation of, of, a, of a Black police officer with this kind of skull like face and, um, and, and sort of distorted proportions. So we'll wrap up this section on Basquiat as a Black artist. 
by um, by looking at this photograph of him that was on the cover of the New York Times magazine in 1985. He's wearing a suit, um, yet no shoes, no socks, um, and and I, I, it, it's an opportunity to sort of talk about the the trope that existed in the media when when Basquiat was discussed, uh, because even before he, well, I should say after he died, usually within the first line or two of, of the description of his life and his work, he is referenced to dying of heroin. And so that sort of characterizes him as a certain kind of person. But typically he was described as, unedu as an uneducated person from the ghetto, which was not his life story at all. Um, so, so there's this, this notion that he's kind of presented as like this quote unquote noble savage. And he really pressed against that. And he called out uh, art critics and interviewers that, um, that leaned into those kinds of assumptions about him. But those, ex those assumptions um, ex were certainly out there and they perpetuated. There were, um, there were some major collectors of his work that approached some major New York City museums in 1988, shortly before Basquiat's death. And they said, you know, we'd like to donate these works to your collections. And the museums, they didn't, first of all, they didn't take them and um, they weren't really, they, they didn't really buy into Basquiat. And when these collectors said, oh no, he's he's so smart, the curators responded with street smart. Is he street smart? And they said, no, he's regular smart. So he was up against all of these kind of negative assumptions about who he was because of his identity. Now let's wrap up on Basquiat with how his life ended and what his legacy looks like today. Now his death is sort of linked to the death of Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol's death came as a surprise to everybody in 1987. He was just going in for some routine surgery. And then um, as a result of, of complications, he passed away. Now he was already um, sort of alienated from Basquiat, but Basquiat took that pretty hard. And over the course of the next year, he goes into a pretty dark place. He's using um, drugs pretty heavily. And even his works kind of change and they have this sort of morbid melancholy quality to them. This, this is called Riding with Death from 1988. Uh, it doesn't have, it's not as, as uh, dense and layered with meaning as so many of the other works that we saw before, but it does sort of seem to have this expressionist uh, or a, a figure here that's rendered with some expressionist qualities and maybe even some references to, to Grey's Anatomy, who knows, but he is riding on the back of the skeletal figure with a human skull here. And this is a direct reference actually to um, uh, Leonardo da Vinci's drawings. It, we can see a similar figure here riding a, a similar skeleton. So um, even though it's a simple composition in this case that it makes it very clear that he's already thinking about his own death, um, it's layered with this kind of symbolism and art historical reference here. So uh, he was, uh, really struggling with drug use. He had intended to enter a rehab program, but he never made it. In August of 1988, uh, Basquiat died from a heroin overdose just a year after Andy Warhol passed away. He had a memorial in Manhattan. It was attended by more than 200 people. This is his gravestone in Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. Now Basquiat was just 27 years old when he died. And of course, there's this kind of uh, mythical notion about creative types that die at a young age. And 27 seems to be this kind of magical number, especially for uh, musicians like Amy Winehouse and Kurt Cobain and Janis Joplin and, and Jimi Hendrix. And so um, we, we think of this as like the forever 27 club and you know it's it's just so sad because for all of these figures and and I think for Basquiat in particular you always wonder what else could they have done um, had they, they lived past this young age so the world responded of course to his death his good friend Keith Haring created this triangular composition called a, a pile of crowns for for Basquiat his former collaborator Al Diaz um appropriately tagged some walls in in um in in Manhattan with uh with the crown and with Basquiat's um dates here and all of this kind of brings us back to that famous painting that we started with uh one of the most expensive paintings ever sold and 
I think hopefully you come away with a, with a new understanding and respect for, for what we see when we look at this. We've got our letter A's over here. We've got things that sort of look like scars or train tracks. We've even got the, um, the tic-tac-toe board up ahead, which uh, up at the top here, which sort of reminds me of that postcard that he sold to Andy Warhol. Um, we've got letters and text that have been painted out here. We've got seemingly layers and layers of paintings that um, underneath this that you can only just kind of peek through even inside his mouth. It almost appears as though you're like pe peering into a tunnel. And all of this is sort of brought together and contained by this skull reference, which is, of course, one of these um, most familiar, most grounded symbols in the history of art too. So there's so much going on here. There's so much to re respect when it comes to Basquiat's work. Now, just very quickly, Basquiat is hardly in any museum collections, but there are exhibitions of his work everywhere. <laughs> I think right now um, that there are like 16 different um, exhibitions of his work worldwide, and these are extremely well attended exhibitions. In addition to that, his paintings have inspired plays. There's one called Samo is Dead that was um, written for uh, the Backyard Opera in Sydney, Australia. Over here on the right, we have a, a play called Collaborators with the actors Paul Bethany and Jeremy Pope playing um, who else? Warhol and Basquiat here. I believe that's being turned into a movie. And there are several movies <laughs> inspired by Basquiat. Um, uh, 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 we have Radiant Child here and Rage to Riches. There's even a children's book called Radiant Child about the artist. These days, we have billionaires trying to cash in on Basquiat's cool. We have um, Jay-Z and Beyonce who, are, um, who were featured in an ad for Tiffany jewelry. And they presented themselves in front of a rarely seen painting by Basquiat here. Imagine trying to enhance your status as a billionaire by, um, by bringing in um, an art, a young dead artist's work like this. And even Jay-Z is uh, you know, sort of styled his hair to look like Basquiat. People sort of made fun of him online for doing that. They called it Basquiat cosplay. Um, Madonna, who, you know, decades later, uh, still references Basquiat on her Instagram stories. I mean, here she's well into her 60s, um, uh, still trying to play up those associations. Now, we can't be as cool as Madonna and Jay-Z and Beyonce, but we can get a little bit of uh, Basquiat to take home with us because you can go on Old Navy right now and buy Basquiat t-shirts for less than $30. So what do we take away from all of this? Well, for we have this idea that for a short time, Basquiat really was like a king. He was like King Midas. Everything he touched turned to gold. He was the most successful Black painter ever. In his lifetime, he broke barriers, and his work still seems so innovative and, re and relevant today. Um, one art historian that I was reading described his work as being like a prophecy. He said it predicts the world of the digital, it predicts the world that the digital age brought into being, one where everyone's conscious is saturated all the time with commerce or race or media or drama or tragedy or the slaughter of black bodies. All of that is going into the work and was uh, and was work that no one else could have produced. So with that, we have Jean-Michel Basquiat, someone who we certainly lost too soon. So I will end there for now, and I welcome any questions that you have about Basquiat. Oh my goodness, Cynthia says, Jean-Michel was my art student when he was in sixth grade. The photo you showed of him was a photo I took when he was 11 or 12. How did you get it? Cynthia, I might have to circle back to you. I, I, I pull most of my images off of the internet actually. So I'll, I'll see if I can track down where I got it. But if you send me an email, I'd be happy to send it to you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And please, I'd love to uh, hear more about him too. So um, if, if you're so inclined, please shoot me an email. Um, uh, Avaya, 
says, I can't get past the square, very ugly heads. There doesn't seem to be any grace. You know, I think a lot of people sort of struggle with that with his works too. And for me personally, when I think of him painting skulls and skulls being such a, um, such an important symbol throughout the history of art and him, it, 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 he's just giving a new spin to it. I think that, um, that helps me to really appreciate him as such an innovative artist, but I can, I can, I can really understand that response to it as well. Osmina says, Apollo, the A looks like a pyramid. Speaking of energy, one of the most, uh, um, one of the most powerful symbols also that A could be seen like a spaceship lifting up. Had you also seen this? Interesting that you say that. Okay, so Osmina, going back to um, the Cy Twombly reference here too. So it's interesting to think about all of the associations that you could have with the letter A in this case, but she's um, noticing, or it says that it sort of reminds her of a spaceship. It would be interesting to kind of explore that in some of Basquiat's work too. Thanks for sharing that, Osmina. Does he have family still living? Great question from Robin. Yes, he does. Um, he has siblings that are still alive. Uh, the estate of Basquiat, which is managed by his family, um, is, is very much involved with his uh, with the presentation of his artwork now. So that King Pleasure exhibition that I just had up on the screen very briefly um, is a presentation. I believe that's the, that's the show that's presented by his family. Um, and so you can find uh, um, interviews with his sisters online. Even though he left home at the age of 17, he still stayed connected to his family. And I think there was like a big moment in his life for him when he could drive back up to his, his parents' house in, um, in a limousine and sort of say like, I made it. So he, uh, he stayed connected to his family and they are still connected to his work and the presentation of it. Um, it says any significance to the bottom right instead of the top right placement of the copyright symbol with the same old logo? That's a great question, Amit. Um, that I'm not sure about. Um, I think my collaborator research friend he is on tonight. So if she knows anything about that, I'm just trying to pull that up here, that the that the little copyright symbol always sort of seems to be hanging at the bottom instead of the top. If anybody has some insight that they'd like to share around that, that that would be great. I, I'm not sure about that, but good eye and thank you for thank you for raising it. Patty says, did his parents live to see his fame? Yes, I think, um, well, I just referenced the story of how he went home in, in the limousine and sort of said, yes, um, I, you know, I've, I've arrived. So they did get to see that, which is wonderful. A for accident, Karen, Karen, uh, Karen adds here, which is, that's a great insight. I didn't even make that connection. Uh, another great reason for him to love this letter A or to be repeating it all the time because there it is. That accident is referenced in so many works. Um, Avia, th thank you so much for your kind words. Let me, I think we got through the questions in the Q&A. Let me look over here at the chat here too. Um, D asked, did he ever try to explain his paintings? That's a great question, D. Um, I haven't come across too many explanations from him in terms of his paintings. There's a lot of ink spilled by art historians <laughs> trying to um, trying to interpret that. Um, that that's a good question, but I, I I don't think he struggled to put into words what what he was trying to capture there. Um, Karen says, thank you. Oh, thank you for your kind words, Karen. I really appreciate it. And, um, and I got another message here that, that mentioned the, the show that was in Boston during COVID. Um, I think maybe some of you had a chance to see that at the MFA, there was a big one, a, a big Basquiat show then. Um, and my collaborator, Lisa says, often a copyright symbol is added in smaller type when um, typeset in text. Thanks for adding that in. And, um, oh, and, and I, I'm getting another message here too from a, a, a friend and collaborator who says, uh, Basquiat did talk about his, uh, his works uh, in response in particular to uh, um, his love of Miles Davis and, and how he makes music. I hope I'm interpreting that right, Janine. Uh, 
<laughs> Patty says maybe an A for an A grade for Basquiat, the, the king. I'm glad that you've um, that that you approve and that you're you, uh, well. You're coronating him now, Patty. <laughs> As uh, oh, thanks for your kind words, Pamela. And um, oh, oh, Jean. Uh, okay, thank you for clarifying. Um, in response response to this idea of did he ever try to explain his paintings. Uh, Janine says pretty succinctly here, I can't remember the exact answer, but he didn't really try to explain them because they cannot really be explained. That was that reference to Miles Davis before. Thank you, Janine, for sharing that. Um, Karen says, in this particular image that's on the screen, the, the crown has four points. Was this before he met Andy Warhol? This work is called Minor Success, and I believe this was 1981. Let me just double check that. Let's see here. Oh, this is 1982. I think he actually knew Warhol by this point. So maybe maybe that that sort of got set in concrete once they become became good friends <laughs> um but thank you for asking that uh um, it says thanks for your kind words and all right i think i got through all of the questions here and i'm so glad that lisa and janine were both on tonight because they have helped so much with this program. And so um, so thanks for backing me up on, on some of those questions that I didn't have the, the right answer to on the, on the tip of my tongue. I appreciate both of you. All right, so I think that just about wraps it up for us. If there are any other questions along the way um, or corrections <laughs> or just comments, I always love to hear from people. Please feel free to get in touch with me on my website. Sorry to scroll through all this so much. It's just my final screen here. Um, my website, which is IamCulturallyCurious.com. So you can get in touch with me through the website. You can also see my calendar of upcoming programs um, and get the free links to those as well. And I really appreciate everybody taking time out of their day to learn a little bit more about Basquiat. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jane. This was such a great presentation. And thank you again so much for everyone for joining us tonight and for the great questions and observations and just your overall participation in these programs. It's really awesome to see. And um, also before we go, um, again, I did put the link to I Am Culturally Curious in the chat. So um, if you get a chance, check that out. Um, and we'll be sure hopefully at some point soon to send out an email with some of that information too. Also, just so that you're all aware, our our next Art on Thursdays is happening in March on the 23rd at 7 p.m. So come join. It's going to be um, Casa and Company, the Woman Impressionists. So come join us for that one next month. And um, again, Jane, thank you so much as always. It's a pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Take All right. Care. Have a good night, everyone.